you want to give your credit card number and social security number, we'll take that. We'll take that. Well, go ahead. Yes. Hello. I am so excited to be here. My name is Debbie Kasta. I'm 71 years old. When I was a young girl, I went to Loyola, and I, I'm Catholic, and I had to take all these religion classes, and I thought to myself, I'm going to take Judaism and Islam, because I am sick of just learning about one thing. But I, it's just very, very cool to be here, and I appreciate this happening. I have one question, though. Why am I taking off my shoes? All right, Sister Debbie, first and foremost, welcome to the mosque. Her question is, why am I taking off my shoes? Really important, this is the mosque area where we pray. As you can see the carpets here, we pray on the carpet and one of the ways that we pray, we stand up, we fold our hands, we bow down and then we prostrate. We literally place our forehead on the ground and we pray to the Creator. So if you come in with the shoes, with all the snow and the dirt and the mud out there, the whole carpet would be bad and we are not able to pray the way that we want to pray. That is the reason we have all the guests and all the Muslims, anyone who comes inside, we take off our shoes. All right, very good question and good observation, Debbie. All right, so Hamza is here with the mic and make sure that you guys keep him busy. Yes, yes, sister. Hi. My name is Kristen. Um, so I invited quite a few people here, including a good friend of mine who is a transgender woman. And she said to me, I don't think I would be welcome there. So I wanted to ask about that. Oh. Um, in general, how are you dealing with members of your faith or outside of your faith that are from the LGBTQ community? All right, so Sister Christine, right? Okay, so Sister Christine is here and uh, she's saying that, you know, some people may feel that they may not be welcome in the mosque, so that's not the case. And I can give you one historical example, Sister Christine, right? Is this mosque is open to every single person. Not only the Muslims. You know, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, around the year 629, uh, some Christians, they knocked at the door and he, they said, we want to come and engage with you. You know, Christians are not believers according to Islam, right? I'm just speaking about Islam. So the Prophet, he welcomed them in. And they stayed three days and three nights in the mosque. They slept in the mosque and the Prophet himself, he served the food. And then the time for prayer came for the Sunday prayer for the Christians. And they said, you know what, can we now get up? We'll be back, let us go outside and pray. The prophet said, you're not going anywhere. You pray right here. They prayed in the mosque. So every person is welcome here. Yes, we may disagree with some theology, some inclinations, uh, but disagreement does not mean that hate and bias and discrimination and you know all the things that people do. Uh, obviously, if a person comes in, with a different theology, we want to have nice, healthy, friendly discussions with the person. So at the end of the day, every single is, uh, person is welcome, our Muslim brothers and sisters, and our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. Yeah, very good, thanks. You know, that takes courage to ask. I really commend you for asking that. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, brother, go ahead. Hi, Sabil, I'm Mike. Um, Mike, so, you're a familiar face, man. Yeah. So I have a question that has to do with the Sunni-Shia split. It's often described as a vague, complicated political disagreement about succession. But what I want to focus in on is the real rupture point, which is the Battle of Karbala. Um, briefly, from more of a Sunni standpoint, this would probably be described as the grandson of Ali refused to um, bend the knee to, uh, what's his name, Yazid, I think. Okay, okay. So, Mike, welcome back. I saw you many times. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Mike's question, brother, Mike's question is about the Sunni and the Shia and the split and some things in history. So, he wants to know more details about that, right? Um, about Sunni and Shia, right? I mean, some of you may also have the question regarding that. So, really quickly, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he uh, died, uh, he passed away in the year 632. So when he passed away, he was the head of the state of the Muslim region. So the Muslims have to appoint a new head of the state. 
Not a new prophet because the prophet was the last prophet according to the Quran. So according to the Quran, chapter 33, verse number 40, it says that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the seal, he is the last prophet. So now the Muslims they want to appoint a new person, a new head of the state. So they were the bigger group of people, they want to nominate someone who was the closest to the prophet, his name was Abu Bakr. And a minority of the group, they want to nominate Ali, and Ali was the son-in-law and the cousin of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Both of them were really eligible to be the head of the state. So it so happened that the majority, their person Abu Bakr, he became the very first head of state, and Ali, he became the fourth head of state in succession. So the minor split between the Muslim community, it was not based upon theology, it was based upon who is going to be the successor based upon politics to some degree. Now later on there are some minor differences. So however, Brother Mike, there are so many things that ha happen in uh, Christian history, Islamic history, Jewish history. We cannot go over all of them because our theology is coming from uh, the Quran and from the life and example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Because if you dwell into the history of any history of any people, even the US history, right? There are the good and the bad that happened. So, but the important fact is this about the Sunni and the Shia, and the fact is this. Both the Sunni and the Shia, they believe in the six beliefs and the five pillars and the basics. So for that reason we say that they are all Muslims, anyone who abides by the six beliefs and the five pillars. But even more important, equal to that is, we don't say that this person is a Sunni, this is a Shia, because there is only one label that God has given to the followers of Islam. And that label is the label of Muslim. So in chapter 22, verse number 78, it says that the followers of Islam are known as Muslims. So if someone asks me the question, Lucy, that Sabil, who are you? Are you Sunni, Shia, Wahhabi, whatever? I say that I am a Muslim. That's the label God has given. So no matter some small uh, theological difference, minute, minute political difference, we say that they are not analogous to the Protestants, Catholics, Jehovah's Witness and Mormons. All Muslims, we have the same concept of who God is. All Muslims, we have only one version of the Quran all over the world. If you go to Saudi Arabia, Wilford, you have the same Quran in Arabic compared to this mosque over here or anywhere in the world. All Muslims, we take Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be as a prophet, as a human, not as divine or son of God. Uh, all of us, we pray in the same direction. Okay, quick quiz question to all of you. Which direction that Muslims pray towards? East. But when I was in India, I was praying towards west. Was I doing something wrong? There you go, right? We pray towards Mecca. In Mecca is the first and the oldest mosque for the worship of one God. So this mosque is pointing towards that direction. People in China, they pray towards west. So that shows unity. And I have been to many churches. There are different ways services is done by different church sects. But all the Muslims are united. So Mike, at the end of the day, we say that all of them are Muslims, Sunni, Shia, as long as we believe six beliefs and five pillars. Islam came to unify humanity. Small theological difference does not matter at the end of the day. Good question, brother. Uh, there's another question we have from the crowd. So again, oh. uh, if there should be index nice cards given everyone, just raise your hand if you don't have a pen. We'll definitely pass that on over. Uh, how do you reconcile the teachings of Islam and the treatment I of women you for in those countries with the extreme interpretation of Islam, especially in Afghanistan? Very good. That's a good question. How do Islam reconcile with some countries in which women are not treated the way Quran wants us to treat them? Important question. It's a big misconception. Okay, let me start with a quiz question to all of you. Name this country, all right? Name this country in which, in which there are 10 million spousal abuses each year. Wait, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, 93,000 plus reported rapes each year, uh, one in five women go through incest. The, the porn industry in that country is $4.5 billion each year and they are objectified. Name that country. There you go, right? United States of America. 
Now, is that reflective of the constitution or is it just the culture that people have made? You know, all of you, so we don't blame the constitution per se, but the people who may be doing those things. And all of you, many of you, you guys came here driving. Uh, there may be some speed limit up there. How many of you were abiding by the speed limit? <laughs> oh, you were. Okay, I applaud you if you are. But majority of us, sometimes, you know, five miles over, one mile over. Do we blame the sign or do we blame us? Very important, all right? So Islam, we say, is perfect. Muslims are imperfect. So we cannot judge Islam based upon the imperfections in some cultures and in some societies, based upon the geopolitical situation or there may be misunderstanding of what Islam actually is. So no matter what we may say or see in Afghanistan, maybe Pakistan, maybe some other countries, it's important for us to know that what Islam is. You know, because I cannot judge. So when I was in uh, India, right, so I was born and raised in India. I used to watch many Hollywood movies. When I came over here, I was really fearing for my life because I thought every one of you carry guns and you shoot each other out in the morning, all right? That was my perception. When I used to go and catch my bus in the morning in the school, I used to look over my shoulder to see who's coming after me, right? So that is the culture, the perception, but the reality was different when I came over here. So it's important that we cannot judge the faith based upon some bad apples of that faith. So really quickly, since we are on the topic of women in Islam, you'll be amazed to find out that before Islam came, women no rights, oppressed, objectified, treated as property and inherited. Majority of the women of that time. But the commandments of God in the Quran and through Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islam uplifted women equal to men spiritually in the eyes of God. So what were some of the rights Islam gave to women quickly? In this country, well actually in the state of Illinois, not until 1861, women, they won the right to own property. In this state, 1861 to be exact. Muslims, we won that right, actually the Muslim women, way back in the 7th century. So Islam was advanced by 13 centuries, even in the great United States of America. You know, when I got married, the clerk in DuPage County, uh, she asked my wife the question, okay, what should we name, what should we change your name to when you get married? She looked at her and she said, why would you like to change my name, change his name, right? Islam gave women the right to keep their maiden name. Not until the 1800s in this country, women won that right. Islam gave that right way back in the 7th century. The right to vote in this country, 1920. Muslim women, they have the, uh, the right to have a say in the political process way back in the 7th century. Okay, look at education. Education. In this country, not until the 1800s, a, a, a lady, uh, she won the right to go to a higher education. Muslim women, they were given that right way back in the 7th century. Now, there is a saying of Muhammad, right? Peace be upon him. He said, every male, every female have an obligation to gain education. Empowered by that, a lady by the name of Fatima al-Fahri. Okay, look at this. In the year 859, Fatima al-Fahri, she laid the foundation to the oldest continuous university in the whole world. Wearing the hijab like you. Which country do you think that campus is? India. Not India, sorry. <laughs> Morocco. Morocco, Nicole, you're right. In the, in the city of Fez, in Morocco, Muslim lady, she constructed the oldest continuous university in the whole world. So when our ladies in this country, they were fighting to go out on the street and to keep their maiden name and to go to you know, colleges and to, keep, and to work, it were the Muslim ladies who were constructing hospitals, pharmacies and then universities. That's what real Islam is. So when we see some Muslim countries, they have taken away the right, we blame them but not the empowering progressive, liberating Islam that God intended for humanity, especially our sisters of humanity. Yes. 
I just wanted to thank you for hosting this event today. Um, I live in the Palatine area, and I just wanted to come meet, you know, the people of Schaumburg. My son, Aiden Brands, is running for school district in 211. He's a progressive candidate, and I'm just here to represent him today. But I do have a question. Um, and I was raised Catholic, and we weren't taught to, like, visit other, you know, religions and stuff like that. So when I came in, I noticed that the women pray separately upstairs and the men down here. Um, is there a reason why men and women are separated during prayer? All right. I forgot your name, sorry. Melissa. Sister Melissa has a wonderful question that why do men and women, they pray separately? So men are going to assemble here and women would be going up there and they would pray up there. And your question is, why is there a separation? First and foremost, we say that we follow uh, what God says in the Quran. In chapter 33, verse number 21, it says that in the person of Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have the best example to follow. For those who believe in God and the last day and remembers Allah God much. So in the mosque of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was a separation. Men used to pray in the front, followed by the children, and then in the back would be the ladies. So we are following his example, right? Number one. Number two, in our, in our prayers, we have certain actions, certain motions. Like we have to bow down, then we prostrate. So it will not be comfortable and decent if a lady is in the front bowing down, prostrating, and men in the back and watching, right? I would not be comfortable for my wife and for my daughter. The third reason can be, when we pray, we literally stand shoulder to shoulder. We are touching each other. Shoulder to shoulder. So, you know, if, suppose my wife is standing and my daughter is here and a strange man is standing in between them. They would not be comfortable. I would not be comfortable. So for any and all of these reasons we say, God, he wants to have us purity of heart and mind. So when we have separation, we can at least achieve that. But important, separation is not only in the mosque. If you go to a... Uh, Greek Orthodox uh, Church, you have separation. If you go to a Orthodox synagogue, you have separation. Again, for the sake of purity of heart and mind, God in his infinite wisdom, he made us pray that way and we are following nothing but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Really quick footnote on the prayer, with the Salman, okay? Give me 30 more seconds, all right? Really quick footnote on the prayer. How many of you have seen Muslims pray? Some of you, right? Maybe some of you saw in YouTube and videos. The way that we pray, obviously we face a direction, the direction of Mecca. And as you can see here, you don't see uh, in the wall, you don't see any depiction of God or Muhammad, peace be upon him, or any saint. When we pray, we directly pray to God. No mediator, because one of the names of God is that God is all knowing his, and he knows us. So when we pray, we directly pray to God without any mediator. But last thing would be about the prayer is, we say that every prophet used to pray the way that Muslims pray. Again, quick reference from Genesis chapter 17, verse number 3. Uh, when Abraham, when he got the good news from God, he bowed down, he prostrated, and he was praying to one God. Jesus, it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, uh, when people were coming after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane. Over there, he prostrated himself and he said that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. And he was praying the way that you see Muslims pray. So we say we worship one God and we also follow the actions and also the prayers of every single prophet and messenger, including Jesus, who we take to be as a prophet. Uh, we have uh, one question here. I noticed the three spires on the mosque roof. What is the meaning? The three? Uh, outside, just the minarets. Oh, the minarets. Okay, so someone, you have good observation, right? <laughs> Looking at the design. Now, all of the minarets and the dome and uh, the chandeliers and the design and the tiles, a mosque does not need to have all of these. Important. The carpet does not have to be green. There does not need to be any design up there. The main thing is that Muslims, we pray in a nice, clean place, worshipping the one creator. All of these things are for aesthetics, just to make it look good. 
Really quickly about the, about the minerals up there. You know, before the invention of uh, the, the microscope and the speaker system, in the countries, like before, like 100 years before, we didn't have the speaker system, right? So people used to go up on the minaret, a person used to go up on the minaret, and he used to do the call for prayer. For the surrounding communities to know, the prayer is about to start. So they can wrap up and then they can come to the mosque and pray. So that was the original intent of the minerals that you see out there. All right. Yes. I think you have a question in the back. Uh, yes, ma'am. Welcome. What is your name? Reverend Shirley Hills. Uh, yes, sir. I'm the pastor at our Redeemers United Methodist Church here in Schaumburg. Thank you for welcoming, welcoming us into your house of prayer. Um, just a quick question. <coughs> Can women be religious leaders in the Islam community? Okay. So first and foremost, welcome, Pastor, to our mosque. I hope you can come more often here with your family. So the question is, can women lead the prayer or they can be spiritual leaders? Uh, yes and no. All right. And the Muslims may be thinking, Sabil, why did you say yes? All right. Generally, uh, women... Uh, they cannot lead, like in the mosque they cannot lead the prayer, it has to be a man, because that's how God commanded and that was the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. However, if only in the circle of women, if the time for prayer comes in, if the women are leading the prayer in their own area, one of the ladies, she can come in the front and then she can become the imam of those ladies. But if it's a mixed gathering, only a man can lead the prayer. However, a lady, a, women, a woman can be a leader in her own capacity, all right? Many mosques around the area, uh, they have uh, women board of directors. Some of them, they have women presidents, all right? There have been thousands of women scholars all throughout history. You know, one of the wives of Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, her name was Aisha. Aisha, she was the scholar of that time, one of the most eminent scholar of the time. Muslims all around, they used to come and uh, they used to obtain lessons from her. There have been women all over the world right now who are in sports. They are educators, professors, you know, important facts, someone you may not know this. There are more women PhDs in Pakistan than all of the PhDs in the US. There are more women members of parliament in Iran than percentage-wise in the USA. There have been eight women head of states of Muslim countries and uh, zero in this country, right? So women in sports and politics and different fields, they can be the, the, they can be the best and they can be the most specialist in that field. So God assigned different responsibilities to men and to women and the responsibility to lead the prayer is for the men. But women can be religious scholars and they can also give education to men and women and children and all of humanity. Good question, sister. Next question. Uh, where is Jesus' mother Mary in Islam? Where? Okay. All right. Important question. There are many, many people mentioned by name in the Quran. There is only one lady whose name is mentioned in the whole Quran. Guess who that is? Mary, yes. Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon her. That distinction God did not give to the mother of uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Nor his wife, nor his daughter, or the believing women of that age. That distinction, the only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran, is Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon her. A lady the Prophet did not even meet. She came 600 years before him. So called a Jewish lady is honored in the Quran by mentioning 34 times. Yeah. So how many times in the New Testament? 18 times. We love her more than you do. <laughs> I have to throw that in there, all right? <laughs> okay, now. In the Quran it says, chapter 3, verse number 42. God sent an angel to Mary and that angel is saying that Mary, God has chosen you and God has purified you and God has chosen you above all the women. 
You know, there have been thousands, millions and billions of women in the history of humanity. God is giving this distinction to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We believe in her uh, giving birth to Jesus when she was a virgin. She is a symbol of chastity, a symbol of modesty. An important fact about her is that she also used to wear the hijab. So Muslim ladies, as you see them wearing the hijab, they are all actually following Mary, the mother of Jesus, a prominent lady for all of humanity, especially for the women in Islam. So that is the prestige, the honor, the love, admiration Islam has given to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Thank you. Amazing, right? Yeah, something new that we learned today. Yes. Any questions on the mic? I don't know I want to get. I think Peggy has a question. Can you talk here, right? Hamza, please come here. Sister Peggy, go for it. Make it easy. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Back in pre-COVID days when I took the train down to work every day and the trains were much more crowded and there are two seat, um, two person seats on the train. Just love uh, There were several times when I would be sitting at the window and a man would come and sit on the aisle next to me, but then he would move over like he was trying to get as close to the aisle as he could. And it just so happens that these people all always looked like they were probably South Asian, and so I was guessing that they possibly were Muslim. Could you explain, are they not supposed to touch a woman that they are not married to or something? Or am I just imagining that that happened? <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Really Thank important you. question. Sister Peggy is asking, when she was... Uh, Traveling on the train to downtown, in the train there used to be seats. If she's sitting here, if a man sits next to her, they would be like, you know, pushing themselves away towards the window, so they are a bit distance. Why is that the reason? Islam is really big about morality and chastity. And having that safe distance between uh, male and female, who are not related. So for that reason, uh, that person or those people who are from the Islamic background, they may be giving some gaps, so by mistake, you know, when train shakes and whatnot, they don't touch you, they don't fall on you, or vice versa. So for that reason, right? Because Islam is big upon uh, the interaction between males and females. You know, actually the Quran says, in chapter 24, verse number 30 to be exact, speaking to the Muslim males, God is saying that all Muslim males, Lower your gaze and guard your modesty. That is better for you in the eyes of God. That means not only we cannot touch an unrelated lady, we cannot look up in her eyes, looking, staring and lusting after her. That's one thing, right? And the same commandment is given to the Muslim ladies too. Second thing is that a man and a woman, we cannot be alone. Unrelated man and woman, we cannot be alone in a room. Because then it says, you know, the third person is shaitan or satan, correct? So, because things may lead to each other, you know, for that reason there's so much, you know, nowadays because of the Me Too movement, I think they need to leave the door open, I guess, right? They cannot be alone and all of that. Islam already said the concept of morality, chastity and the safe distance and the respect between males and females. So, perhaps for that reason, they are respecting you and your privacy, right? For the sake of chastity and morality. Yes. Uh, next question we have. Do women have to cover their head or is it by choice? If they do, why? All right, good question. So why are women covering the hijab? Uh, first and foremost, uh, okay, let me start with this analogy, right? You know, when we go to schools and colleges, uh, those who are children, teenagers, the youth over here, there's always a dress code in schools and colleges. There's always a dress code in any workplace that we go to. There's a dress code in a restaurant, right? No shirt, no shoes, no service. It's a dress code. So we say that God has given a dress code for humans, which is the dress code of modesty and chastity. So when women, when you see they are covering themselves, the number one reason they're doing it is because God has commanded them to cover. So this is in chapter 24 of the Quran. 
uh, verse number 31 and chapter 33 of the Quran, verse number 59. However, covering is not only for women, it is also for men, right? Surprise. So me and the brothers over here, we also have a dress code. We also cannot wear tight clothes. We have to cover certain portions of the body. We cannot wear transparent clothes. We cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender. We cannot wear clothes which are so extravagant waste of money. So there's a dress code for males and a dress code for females. Important. But in the secular world also, there is always a dress code. There are about 14 states in the USA in which a woman, if she goes shirtless, she'll be arrested. Yes, there are dress code in a secular society, any society, religious society, there's always a dress code. You know, there's always a dress code also in the Old Testament, in the faith of Judaism. Anyone from the Jewish faith here? Okay, okay. Oh, you are, right? So, according to the Jewish faith, a Jewish lady, once she's married, she cannot show her hair. She has to cover. So, that is hijab. Even the Christian sisters, it says in the New Testament, in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse number 5 and 6. Especially in the prayer, when you go to church, you cannot show your hair. If you show your hair, that's dishonor in front of God. So, there is a concept of hijab even for the Christian sisters. So no matter any which way, yeah, there is, right? Sydney is thinking, really, is that so? Yes, I'm just speaking about the Bible though, right? Maybe the church may have a different policies now, but if you look into the New Testament and the Old Testament and into the Quran, that's also one of the commonalities, the concept of modesty and chastity and morality is there. Not only, only for the females, but also for the males. And chastity, leads towards a greater chastity in the society and that makes us you know respect each other not to objectify each other so for all of the reasons god has given this wonderful commandment of hijab uh, covering modesty uh, that is for both males and females you know lastly on the concept of modesty modesty is not only what we wear islam is big about the modesty of our eyes as i mentioned right we cannot Look and stare and lust after any person. Modesty of our ears, modesty of the tongue. You know, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that uh, say something good or remain silent. <laughs> All right? I always joke how many marriages can be saved? Right? If everyone obeys that rule, come on, we get angry, we say things, then we regret. Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said say something good or just remain silent. This is the wonderful commandment of God. At the end of the day, modesty is a good virtue for all of humanity. Yes. So we have about five minutes left. Um, I know there are a couple more questions. We might not get through all of them, but again, feel free to walk up afterwards uh, to the next field and we'll definitely be able to address it. Uh, this can probably be maybe the final question. Uh, why do most Muslims pray five times a day, and Ismaili Muslims only three times. All right. So the question is, uh, why do many Muslims pray five times? And there may be some Muslims uh, who say they are Muslims and they only pray three times. Sources for guidance for Muslims. One is the Quran, and the second one are the sayings, the practices, and the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Quran, all of you are familiar with, this is the Quran, this is the translation actually. The actual Quran is in Arabic language. This is the primary guidance for Muslims. And how Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how he practiced it, how he did the interpretation, and how he implemented the Quran in the society, there are separate books regarding that, regarding how he implemented and how he practiced. So you have the Quran and the Sunnah as we say, these are the two sources of Islam. So the Quran mentions that Muslims are to pray. Quran does not mention how many times. Muhammad, peace be upon him, again indirectly revelation from God, he says that every Muslim should pray five times a day. So the word five is there. However, some people what they do is with their own interpretation, they combine some of the prayers, so they still may pray five prayers, but they combine uh, you know, the second and the third prayer and uh, they may combine the fourth and the fifth prayer. 
But at the end of the day, every Muslim, according to the Quran in the prophetic example, we are supposed to pray five times. But then you may be thinking, okay, you know what, five times, you know, we can take our time. Just five minutes, seven minutes for each prayer is not a big deal. You know, we take time to snack, we take time when our, in our work, we take time when we are in school. So just taking a minute amount of time to connect towards the Creator. So the way that I describe the five prayers is this. We eat certain number of times to nourish our bodies. We connect with the Creator at least five times to nourish our souls. So for that reason, it's a commandment from the Creator. That's the reason we pray five times a day. So we are always conscious that there is a Creator, that there is a higher, greater, bigger purpose in life. You know, God is watching, be conscious. One day you have to stand in front of God. So all of this God consciousness should make a person a better human, a better neighbor, a better family member. And at the end of the day, humanity would be better if people follow that important commandment. Thank you, Dr. Sabil. Can we give a round of applause to Dr. Sabil and also all of our leadership? This has been the past month, or the past two months.